اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ رب العالمین وافضل الصلاة وعتم تسلیم على سیدنا محمد وعنا آله وصحبه اجمعین وردی اللہ تعالی عنا سادة تابعین وعلماء الامدین وعائمات العربات المجتهدین ومقالدیهم من یوم الدین اما بعد Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Alhamdulillah, we begin with the name of Allah, the most gracious, gracious, most merciful. We praise Allah, the Lord of the worlds, and we send a complete peace and blessings upon our master, Muhammad and his family and his companions. We pray that Allah is pleased with the elite from among the second generation of Muslims, the right acting scholars, the four mujtahid imams, and all of those who follow them until the day of judgment, ameen. Alhamdulillah, we are reading the book that you see on your screen entitled Writing His Way to Spiritual Freedom, The Life and Works of Umar Ibn Said by our brother Muhammad Abdullah Al-Ahari. Hafidhullah, may Allah protect and preserve him. And if you wish to purchase your own copy of this text, you can visit our website that I hope my wife will put on in the comments and on the screen for you, 
www.nurulzamaninstitute.org. Alhamdulillah, these types of books are very good because they provide an often overlooked link in our Islamic history as Muslims in America in general, and particularly as Black American Muslims. When we look into our history of Islam in this country, most of the time, the narrative that you hear, you hear about or you read about groups like the Morris Science Temple and the Nation of Islam, what they call proto or pseudo Islamic groups. And then you hear about immigration reform that came as a result of the civil rights movement and legislation. And then you hear about all of these immigrants from the Muslim world migrating here. And then at the same time, you hear about those people in the nation of Islam coming over to Orthodox Islam because of the work of Imam Waratuddin Muhammad, Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him, and converting all of those former members of the Nation of Islam to Orthodox Islam. And then you, you know, you hear a narrative like that, meaning immigrants, former NOI to the present day. And in that narrative, there's a whole lot of other stories that are left out. Usually the history and the role of the Daro Islam movement is left out. And even some of those masajid and communities who are affiliated with the Dar, they have their own unique history. Like Masjid Mu'minun in Cleveland, Ohio, the Islamic revivalist movement, IRM, with Imam Mutawaf. Usually that whole rich history that's left out. Then you go back around that same time period, the Islamic party, that's left out. Then you go back before then, and you have the movement and leaders that grew out of the Moorish Science Temple, like Professor Izzuddin. Who, that whole thing is left out in the organization and organizations that he started. And alhamdulillah, our brothers like Akil Fahad is shedding light on that history. A lot of which is based in Detroit and other places, but that's left out and the major impact that had. Then you go back before then and you have influential figures like Duse Muhammad, who was a mentor and a colleague of uh, Marcus, Gar Marcus Garvey. And the members of the UNIA, Marcus Garvey's organization, who are Muslims, and that's left out. And then another contemporary, Sati Majid, both of these people from Sudan, right? and the Dawah efforts they've done in the United States, and not only with those people who were from the Muslim world, but even amongst Black people,
they put in work in the field of dawah. That's left out. Then you go before that time period, right? And you have the history of many people who were enslaved, who we know were practicing Muslims and their Islam and their history and all of that is documented. That's left out. And this is the part, the area that we're dealing with now because one of those people was Umar ibn Sayyid. May Allah have mercy on him. Right? But even if you go before that, or what led to the enslavement of people like Umar ibn Sayyid, where these people came from, West Africa, and the level and the height and the extent of Islam in that place, that's not spoken about. So we have a whole huge chunk of our history that's just purposely, intentionally, and loudly omitted. When you omit something, it's usually done quietly. But if you even have a, a little smidget of knowledge about this history, you know that them leaving it out is loud. It's not silent. It's loud. You ever heard of the phrase, a loud silence? That's, that's how it is. It's so loud. It's loud and obvious that you're leaving something out. And so, you know, it is our intent in having these black lessons, not just for the purpose of just having class, just to and have class, but it's important to know your history. It's a mandate, it's a reason, it's an order that's mentioned in the Quran, in plain sight, right in front of you, and all of us know the verse. But the verse is never explained to us in the way that the classical commentators of the Quran explain the verse to us. And so do Hujurat, old mankind. Yeah, you had Naz. In the Kalaka Nakum in Dakarin Wa Untha. Indeed, we created you from a male and a female. Well, Ja'al Nakum Shu'uba Wa Kaba'ila. And we made you, Allah made you, Allah, it's the royal we, the na, the, the attached pronoun, ja'al na, we made you, shu'uban, big ethnic groups, wakaba'ila, smaller ethnic groups. You didn't make yourself into ethnic groups. You did that. Allah did that. Li, for what reason? Ta'arrafu, so that you may know. Know who? So that you may know yourself and you may know others than other than yourself. Indeed, the most honorable of you, or the most noble of you to Allah is he who has the most taqwa. Inna Allah alimun khabir. And Allah is the all-knowing, all-aware. And we've explained on several occasions how this verse right here is an indication, explicit indication, that you must, you should have knowledge of self. You don't have to go outside of Islam to justify having knowledge of self. It's right there in the book of Allah. But when people explain this verse to you, they give their own tafsir of it, which is inconsistent with what everybody else said about the, that verse. So it is our intent uh, by having these black lessons to fill those voids, to fill in the blanks to make us whole again and to play our part and not letting people get away with the hustle, the game that they've been running on us and giving us this half, half baked, deformed type of Islam. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us success in that. If you pay attention to the title, the black lessons, they have a number so this is an ongoing series that I do typically when we're in between books that we're covering or at other times that we deem it necessary. 
So, you know, it's not just, you know, one time. This is what I think lesson 55, right? We've been doing this for a few years off and on. So this is a long series of ongoing classes that we've put together under the title Black Lessons. And if you go to our YouTube channel and look for the playlist, the Black Lessons, you'll find all of these lessons there. Well, alhamdulillah, as we mentioned, uh, right now, we are in this book doing a deep dive on Umar ibn Said. And alhamdulillah, uh, the author of the book said he would uh, try to try to listen. So it's always good when you have people who were directly involved with the research, commenting, correcting, and elucidating uh, on their works. It brings, brings it to life. Alhamdulillah. So before we get into where we left off at, and we left off on page 59, inshallah. But before we get back there, I just want to uh, mention, you know, what's going on in uh, my second home. Uh, my second home is the Gambia. And, you know, they've been having very, very, very heavy rains. But not only Gambia, I hear Uganda and maybe some other countries is having extremely heavy rains as well. Uh, and you have to understand, you know, a lot of a lot of us, we think that every place on earth has four seasons like we have here, like summer, winter, spring and fall. We think all over the earth is like that. No, it's not like that in all over the earth, right? Like a lot of people ask me when I go to Gambia, what is their winter like? They don't have winter. They don't have four seasons. They got two seasons, dry and wet. <laughs> right? You have the dry season and rainy season. They're in the middle of their rainy season. And for the last several days, it's been raining extremely hard. I saw a video today where it was raining so hard. And they showed a house. And there was some, the people, uh, the people had their, uh, their belongings on like their porch, like on the wall, on the ledge of the wall. And it's raining so hard, so much moisture. First of all, it's like a river and, you know, in front of the house and all around it and in the house. And then the wall of the house, the external wall of the house collapsed. That's how. So a lot of them have it very rough. So, you know, just wanted to keep that in mind. I just wanted to remind you that what's going on. When we did our tour, we just came back a uh, little less than a month ago. And when we scheduled the tour, we scheduled the tour, it was, it was the intent to beat the rainy season, right? And usually for the most part there, when it's not the rainy season, it don't rain, right? You may get a rain one off here and there, but basically it just no rain, period, for all of those months, right? And the rainy season, when it does come, it's a different story. Some And there's usually no drizzle. You know how when it rains here in America, it can be, you know, misty, a little drizzle. Nah, it's rarely a drizzle there. If it's drizzling, that means it's just getting warmed up. It's a deluge. It's a downpour. And sometimes that downpour could be going on for several days, nonstop. And from what I understand, this is what they are experiencing now. And so uh, I mentioned the tour because it's actually started raining before the tour. But, you know, and I was shocked because I, I was trying to beat the rainy season. But it started a little early. But alhamdulillah, we didn't get too much of it while we were there. But now they're in the middle of it, or almost in the middle of it. And it's, and it's coming down. A lot of people is, is, is going through it. You know, so uh, uh, let's uh, recite al-Fatiha. 
for all of those who are being displaced, having their properties destroyed and all of these things. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easier for them and let's uh, recite al fatiha for them. Alhamdulillah. Let me see who we have in here. Fatima, Jackie, Talib, Imamu, Imad, Abdul Bar, Hakim, Durahim, Anthony, Abdul Haq, Farouk, Abdullah, Isa, Abdul Qadir, Malika, Amina, Kashif. Dorauf, Imam, Alhamdulillah, Adil, all of you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And assalamu alaikum to you, Samira. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. Wa alaikum salam to let you catch. You sure you good? That's all I can be right now. <laughs> you know why I asked you that. <laughs> Yeah, I can't even get in my phone. Let me tell you how uh, the world is talking to the audience, listening to it for class. I had dropped my phone. I didn't know I dropped my phone, but I discovered I dropped my phone while taking care of business. And I have that tracking device, you know, tracking app rather, where my phone was. So I figured it was secure. It was at a business. I'll get it the next day. But I looked back at the app and it was like away from the business. So I said, oh, somebody done got my phone. So I sent the APB out. You know, you could send a text message. You could send a long, you know, make the alarm go off on it. Nothing. So I'm like, it's just stationary. There. I said, let me go back. Uh, you know, let me. Um, uh, what's the word? Um, double back. back. Yeah, backtrack where, you know, where I might have um, dropped it. So I get to the spot. I didn't see my phone right away, but something told me, just look around, you know, look look, look further around um, the area. And so I see my phone in a vacant lot. Looked like somebody took a BB gun and just shot it up. So now it's like, I can't get my, you know, my information off, my photos and stuff and such. And I'm like, why people just have to do that? You know, uh, someone with sense will see the phone. There's a business right there. Maybe it belonged to someone there. Or maybe I should just call the person that whose phone this belongs to because I left them a number to call. But you can call from the device itself. And I'm, and I'm just, you know, I'm not mad. It's just sad that we, you know, that people i don't know if it was an adult or a child it don't even matter it's just we have no regard for property whatsoever and it's just it's disgusting but i'm not mad i'm just frustrated i can't get my information off i'm gonna have to race it but alhamdulillah they did me a favor because they threw it in the lot they could have took it home you know unlocked it and got my information off but they did me a favor by just throwing it in the lot now i have my information i can secure my information but it just, I don't know, it just, <laughs> people don't have regards for other people's, you know, property. And it really um, got to me because I saw something on social media where they are stealing catalytic converters off of people's cars. I've never heard that before. It's bad. You know, the catalytic converter is the thing that sits under the car to, I guess, like filter out the uh, exhaust, right, that comes from the car from the engine or what have you, they're still in that. Like, what the heck is going on? We're going to have to be around here like Flintstones and have a rock <laughs> as wheels and some wood, <laughs> the seats, <laughs> the frame and everything. It's a bad lot. Like I said, like I told you, you could have lost your phone in Gambia. <laughs> trust me, they wouldn't have broke that phone up. That phone would have been unlocked. Okay, what kind of security you got on it? Somebody... And Dugay would have got around all that stuff, got all your information. No, you didn't your say phone you, you. Did you say in Dungay? Yeah. <laughs> your phone would have been in the black market. 
it would have been unlocked. You're all right. good information taken and it being in use. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Subhanallah. They're not destroying no phone over there. They're using that. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I'm good. I just can't get a new one now. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> anyway, let's start. Audu Balahim and Ashaytan Rajim. Audu Balahim and Ashaytan Rajim. Audu Balahim and Ashaytan Rajim. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Salalahu Allah Sayyidina Muhammad and Wa Alihi was Sattihi was Salama Tasliman. Alhamdulillahi Wakafa. Wassalamu ala ibadhi ladina stofa amma ba'd. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, I seek refuge in Allah from the rejected shaitan. May Allah bless our master, Sayyidina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, companions, and give them peace. All praise are due to Allah, for he is sufficient for us. Peace be upon his slaves whom he has chosen. As to what follows, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to everyone. And wa alaikum assalamu warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to everyone that has given the greetings. We're on page 59. A list of extant manuscripts by Omar Ibn Said. Rahimullah. And so before you read that, I just want to remind, you know, our class that last Thursday we read a section and he basically gave he mentioned some of the books that umar ibn Said mentioned in his own writings or that he quoted from and you know his studies and this is extremely important I'm talking about what we read already this last thursday because it gives you a snapshot on what islamic education looked like during his time where he came from and we already said that he came from what is a part of what is now part of the country uh, known as Senegal, uh, but Futatoro, and he was Fulani. And so we get we get an idea of what scholarship looked like. And he was a scholar. He studied for over 25 years, made Hajj and everything before he was captured and enslaved. And so a lot of times, you know, we talk, because like for, I keep referring back to our tour. Our tour is called Tracing Our Islamic Roots. And when you trace your Islamic roots, you know, if you look at what he mentioned, what he studied and what he spoke about, this is where our roots go back to. So this is information is extremely important. Don't sleep on it. OK, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Bismillah. Manuscript one, the 1837 epistle. The earliest extant text was a letter dated April 22nd, 1837, which was presented as a gift of Moses steward to Andover Theological Theological Seminary Library in the year 1837. It was acquired by Yale University as part of the establishment of the Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School in 2017. The two-page manuscript was included with a letter from Judge Taylor to Moses Stewart. Moses Stewart was professor of biblical studies at Andover Theological Seminary from 1810 to 1848. Also in the same collection is a copy of an article from the Missionary Herald that discusses Saeed's manuscript, Taylor's letter, and subsequent events and writings by Saeed. The contents of this manuscript are an introduction conveying a greeting to Major John Owen in Raleigh and ayats from the Quran and from treaties on Arabic grammar. Omar also included passages from texts he studied. A feature found in several of Omar's texts is the presence of geometric drawing, which encloses some of the texts. In the center of the first page, a geometric drawing encloses the Arabic text, Sheikh Joan Jim Owen, General Jim Owen, along with two unidentified words. If you look in the footnotes here, 62 and 63, he says the portions of the Quran that he's quoting is Surah Najm, which is chapter number 53, verses 21 to 23, Surah uh, uh, Lahab or Masad 1 and 2, uh, Bakara 285 286, Fusilat verse 46, uh, Abbasa 34 37, Inf uh, Infitar uh, 
uh, verse number 19, Surah Naba 40, and Surah Muk 1 to 13. And he says, quotations from grammatical treaties, treatises include verses from Mulhatul Arab of uh, Har Hariri that he mentioned earlier that we read on Thursday, and al fiyad bin Malik. Uh, also, we mentioned that before. So just keep in mind that even in slave all these years, and these things are coming from memory. It's not like he's, he has a library in front of him and he can just go to all of these things. This thing's coming from memory. Go ahead. Manuscript two, Arabic sentences and translation written by a slave owned by General Owen in Wilmington, North Carolina. Manuscript undated found in Horton Library at Harvard University. Collection, Charles Sumner Scrapbook. Item box one, identifier, MSAM 1.68, page 47. Translation by George Sumner, brother of Charles Sumner. It includes a Surah Hamaza from the Quran. Mm -hmm. Manuscript three, John Owen, 1787 to 1841. Papers, PC.812, State Archives, State of North Carolina, Lord's Prayer, mislabeled 23rd Psalm, 1828, Manuscript 4, John Owen, 1787 to 1841, Papers, PC.812, State Archives, State of North Carolina, List of Owen Family Names, Mismarked the Lord's Prayer. Manuscript 5, a two-page letter from Omar ibn Said, Rahim Allah, to John Taylor, 1853, held at the Spartanburg County Historical Association. Manuscript 6, Surah Tulnasa, uh, 1857, a note on the back written in English by someone other than Omar incorrectly identifies it as the Lord's Prayer. From the North Carolina Collection, Wilson Special Collections Library, UNC Chapel Hill. Manuscript 7 through 10, four pages of Omar ibn Said's inscription in the notebook of Eliza Owen, Journal, Owen and Barry Family Papers, New Hanover County Public Library in Wilmington, North Carolina. Manuscript num manuscript 11, signature of Omar Said, Omar ibn Said Adam, held in the Simon Grant Gratz Collection at Historical Society of Pennsylvania, HSP and cataloged as Arabian, Simon Gratz Collection Alphabetical Series. Manuscript 12, Surah Quraysh and Hamaza from January 8, 1845. Manuscript 13, the John Frederick Ford, 23rd Psalms, in the name of Allah, the most merciful and gracious. May Allah have mercy on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu I am beginning to write this writing manuscript in the year 1855 in the month November, in the 11th day, Monday, then follows the 23rd Psalm, then follows. I have sent forth this writing manuscript through thy mercy, which is named over me. Published in Forts 1903, North America and Africa, their past, present and future with a solution to the Negro problem, along with a three-page bio biograph Biograph sketch of Omar. Allah. Manuscript, four, manuscript 14. The Brown manuscript of the Lord's Prayer was donated to Dayson College along with the Arabic Bible in 1871. The manuscript is not dated and has a signature. My name is Omar Ibn Said. Manuscript 15. The blue manuscript of the Lord's Prayer was donated to Davidson College in 1963 by James Alvin Raleigh of Columbia, South Carolina. Mr. Rowley believed that his grandfather, Reverend, Chain, Reverend Charles Wilson, obtained the writing while serving the Methodist Episcopal Church near Wilmington, North Carolina, circa 1830s to the 1840s. A note on the reverse was written by Reverend Charles Wilson and, read, and reads, written by an old African Negro belonging to General Owens of Wilmington, North Carolina. Manuscript 16. Carved tree trunk near Owens Hill, Owens Hill Cemetery is near where Omar's final cabin and grave was. It says, La ilaha illallah, 
there is no deity except Allah. Manuscript 17, Omar ibn Said, 1831, autobiography is around 2,000 words in Arabic. It is his longest manuscript and consists of 24 pages of which seven are blank. It was lost from 1925 till it was rediscovered and purchased by Derek Beard in 1995. With the death of Beard in July 2016, it was put up for auction. In 2017, it was purchased by the Library of Con Congress with 42 related documents. Manuscript 18, Omar Ibn Said's Arabic Bible. Omar's Bible was purchased in 1819 by James Owen from Omar. Owen was able to import the translation with the help of two friends at the American Colonization Society. John Lewis Taylor, Chief Justice of North Carolina, and Francis Scott Key, a lawyer and author of the Star Spangled Banner. The Bible has 49 annotations written by Omar and has his handmade covers. Many are the English names of chapters written in Arabic script. The Holy Bible contained Old and New Testaments in the Arabic language, Newcastle upon Tyne, 1811. There is a donation card pasted on the front cover of the Arabic Bible, which reads, Old Uncle Moreau's Arabic Bible presented to the Williams Missionary Association, Davidson College, by Mrs. Ellen Guion, Charlotte, North Carolina, April 1871. Guion was the daughter of, of when was the daughter of Governor James Owen. Manuscripts 19 through 20. This is a bifold manuscript held at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It was written in 1857 and contains the law of prayer and 51st Psalms. It is the longest quotation Omar gave from the Bible and is only copy of his psalm by his hand. Let me continue. Mm -hmm. Studies on the life and works of Omar Ibn Said. James Sun's 1925 article in the American Historical Review marks the first major scholarly study with a focus on the autobiography Omar Ibn Said and its connection to the larger genre of slave narratives. The translation of the article in Jameson's study of the autobiography of Omar Ibn Said was based upon one by Reverend Isaac Byrd and mentions the earlier study of Cathedral without attribution of either one as the author of the translation. Jameson skillfully drew together much of the material materials available about Omar Ibn Said, whether in Arabic with translation or from newspapers, letters, and journal articles. Alan Austin's African Muslim in Antebellum America, 1984, collected the available materials on Omar Ibn Said and some 75 other Muslims from the ear of slavery in the United States. This was one of the first time that this topic was treated fully rather than as an isolated article. Austin was able to find translator for many of the Arabic texts he presented and placed them in other articles in a historical, his historic tech context. His collection allowed later researchers resources to do later work for their own doc doctoral, doctoral and master's studies on Islam in the Americas. Theodore Dwight's research on Omar and Lemon Kibbe is detailed elsewhere in this text. Without his efforts, Omar's autobiography likely would not have been translated, nor would texts from other Muslim authors in Liberia and the United States have been collected. Two translations of Omar's autobiography were a result of his work with the Foreign Bible Society and the American Oriental Society. His work on Kebe's education can be used to understand Omar's academic background. Richard Robert Madden translated the autobiography and poems of Juan Francisco Manzano to English. He was also responsible for collections letter and information about the condition of former slaves in Jamaica and preserving data about the presence of Muslims in, the, in that British colony. Manzano was the author of the only Spanish language slave narrative and is useful in comparing the condition of people held under slavery in British and Spanish colonies. Macarone compared the Spanish language 
original of Mazzano's text with the English translation of Omar Ibn Said's biography. The, the dissertation is in Spanish. The language and discussion of slavery in each text is presented in a well-developed fashion. Savat Safat Nobuk Dabovic, 2009, used critical literary theory and the idea of historic and literary displacement to expand on the work of Alan Austin and others to explain how the early Muslim authors and subjects of slaves' narrative could be included in the larger canons of American literature. He relied on the theories of Giles de Luz and Felix Guattari, Stuart Hall, Angelica Bama, Edward Glissant, and Home Baba to plot a path towards a new reading of these texts which transcends national and religious boundaries. Ella Ilrias, 2011, marked the first collection of essays on Omar Ibn Said and facsimile reproduction of his autobiography with translation by El Riaz on facing pages. The book includes an introduction by translator Ala El Riaz and several contextualizing essays by Hunwick, Cam Hunwick Camille F. Forbes, and Gada Osman, and Alan D. Austin. This also includes a translation of the Yale University manuscript from the Francis Scott Key Papers. The essay by Alan Austin focuses on his research on African Muslims in antebellum America since his 1984 source book. Akil Kahara's 2004 study of Omar Ibn Said's autobiography is based, is based his reading of Surah Mulk in his autobiography. Omar's discussion of his servitude is placed in the context of his education and his life experience before and during slavery. His use of this surah shows the conflict between slavery and religious sanctions for it. al Badai, April 2017, present, presents the writings of Omar Ibn Said, Ayub bin Suleiman, Job bin Sol Solomon, Abdurrahman Ibrahim, Muhammad, Gordo Bakwaka, Bakwaka, Lemon Kebe, Muhammad Ali bin Said, Nicholas Said, and Bilali Muhammad bin Ali. In the context of other slave narratives, autobiographies, biographies, and American literature as a whole, Al Badai explores why their narratives are not anthologized and proposes the inclusion of African American Muslim slave narratives in American literature. The inclusions of these texts in the corpus of slave narratives in both American and African American lit literature will give voice to the previously unvoiced Muslims in the United States during the era of slavery. This process would bear valuable, valuable fruit due to the critical race theory and the process of decolonization of literature of minority writers. Zainab McHemek. 2017 argues against a full inclusion of the text of Omar Ibn Said and Bilali Muhammad into the canon of American literature due to their perceived difficulty of interpretation. Her analysis adds to the paratextual interpretation when she discusses text markers and decorations featured in Omar and Bilali's text. However, her questioning the level of literacy or value as pieces of literature detracts from the value of her discussion. Herlands, 2017, senior thesis in history covers much of the same ground as al Badai, 2017, and Cameron, 2015. Her work divides the narratives between those that were biographies and those that were autobiographies. However, she does not argue for more than the need to analyze their contributions to history. Taplin, 2016, a professor of Arabic from Harvard University argues, like McHammack, 2017, that the writings of Omar Ibn Said should be viewed as being from a semi-literate author and thus are full of grammar, spelling, interpretation issues. <laughs> Woo. Sometimes reading this, uh, and I'm glad he mentioned all of these things, right? 
you know, uh, you know what it, it's reminding me of, Samira? Mm. Like, forgetting, I'm sure they're well aware uh, of how uh, literacy in and of itself was a crime for people that were enslaved in most of the places if most, if not all of the places where our ancestors were enslaved, right? And so, and so, especially in the case of Umar ibn Said, where he mentions in more than one place how, you know, he tells you himself that you're going to find, and we read past that already last week, how you're going to find grammatical errors in his writing because it's been so long since he's, uh, written his own own language as well as the Arabic language. He says that himself, right? But I laugh because I got that same feeling. You know how when we was in Gory Island and when we're there, right? It's different for us. But when other people are there, it's like they're just in like a regular museum looking at paintings and stuff. Like, oh, look at that right there. Right. And, you know, just right. being in that space with people who don't necessarily have a connection, nor really a care about why they're there. Right. You know, you, you have to like control yourself from getting mad. Like, yo, this this is this is an indication of the genocide that was done to our people for generations. Right. And you come in here like, you know, like it's just a casual walk in the beach, you know, you know, you know, dre dressing like you out here for the club and, you know, all, you know, kiki and ha ha and laughing like it's like, like, you know, all of us, I think when we were there, we, we noticed people like that. And we like, you know what, <laughs> like it's going to have to, we're going to have to like, it took a lot of self-control for us to not engage them people like that. Exactly. And like. With people like that, you can't even like really explain to them how their their attitude and their even their disposition is wrong. Like I remember when you and the sisters went in that small spot that w was uh, was reserved for rebellious men, right? A few, when y'all went in there, right? I was standing in front of it, and some other people. Wanted to come by and take pictures. I'm like, no, man, move. No, no, go. No pictures. No. Right? Mm -hmm. Like you are connecting, you and the sisters are connecting to your, you know, your your spiritual past or whatever. And for them, it's just a photo op. Like, like, no, you ain't taking no pictures. Move. Go ahead, man. Go. SubhanAllah. Can I add to that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because you just reminded me of that scene now we you know we had our at least two uh, reflections on the tour and mentioning the different places that we went to and one was the uh was gory island and i just want to make it more graphic for the uh, listening audience if you don't understand we that building that they held the slaves where they tortured our men who were being rebellious to the point where they would rather be a slave than to be in that, in that area. Right. And raping our women, right. Raping them and doing all types of stuff, types of things to them while they wait to get on this boat. Right. These are rooms that the floors were, uh, were filled with feces and urine and all types of, you know, you know, nudges because they had no other place to go they forced them to stand in these places for weeks at a time and months right and all this is going on so if you notice you see that picture with the you know the infamous stairs that come down and downstairs is where the slaves were held upstairs is where the slave catchers and the slave masters were that's that was their area right that's where they partied and chilled and what have you upstairs which I didn't care to go up there. I felt, I felt, I, I didn't feel right being up there. You know what I'm saying? Because when you were up there, you're looking down. You're looking down. If you notice the pictures that we have and the videos, you're looking down at the rocks and the water. They were actually looking down 
at these people that they stole from their tribes, from their families and everything, right? And just celebrating and doing all types of, you know, whatnots up there, right? So just keep that in mind. And then you have people that's coming here to visit this historical landmark in hoochie mama clothes. Real short, provocative, tight, like they about to have a a a, a, a photo a photo uh, um a photo session right there in the door of no return. Like it was disgusting. Like what you come here for? That's how you that's how you dress. That's how you honor this place. This is how you remember those that came before you. This is how you come. It was just like it was like a disconnection, and it, it just like it just like disturbed you know, the, and it's no peace there, but it just disturbed, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to get out of it by seeing that. It just, it was just, it was just mind boggling. And then at the same time, there was a, a group of um, school children that was coming on a trip. They ha ha kiki, you know what kids do on a school trip. They are at this historical site and it was just like nothing. I'm just coming there just to see what, what what you know the teacher got us coming out here to visit this place and yeah with slaves and what have you you know and it was just like i'm we're looking at this and it's like but we came here to trace our roots to follow in our you know ancestor footsteps to see how they felt you know at least try to get a piece of that and you come in here like you just want to have a, a instagram um shot you know, video or shorts or whatever you want to do at the door of no return. So I will not be surprised if that's circling and circulating in, you know, in the universe, in the metaverse, that these hoochie mama girls came there looking like that. Like you don't have, you don't have any, you know, any shame. Like it didn't make you feel any ways. And no, they didn't look like they had any shame. And it, it just, Sapala, and for this person to critique someone that went through as, as much as they did, as well as millions, like who who the hell are you? Like you just disregarding that they even have, they even able to speak or even write. That was a crime. We was killed. We was murdered, tortured for reading and writing that people take advantage right now. Like it's just we got a lot of work to do and we got to get out that mindset of not wanting to learn. Like we have an aversion to history in, in learning. Like it's just, ugh, that's boring. I don't want to do that. So you look how, you know, the, the system has it. They develop, you know, platforms like TikTok. Oh, they got short tensions, man. We can, you know, have them to look at a video for three minutes. It used to be less and keep their attention, but you can't even read a book without keeping your eyes open. You can't even read the Quran without yawning and have and, and make an excuse to do other things. So this is what the imam is trying to, you know, relate to you while we were there. And we have to keep these places sacred. When we go there, you got to let it be known. Listen, we're not having that. Like we have made a joke, but ain't no Karens over here. We're back home. We're not doing that just to be seen. We're just letting it be known that this is where we came from. And we're trying to recapture, you know, the essence of that. And then you have forgotten and you over there already. You think the Africans know their history? They don't either. A lot of times. They don't know nothing. The word that keeps coming to my mind is disconnect. Like us, we're back there consciously because we're trying to reconnect, right? Then you have uh, Europeans and other non, uh, black, non blacks there, they're disconnected. And then even you have, uh, Africans that are there, like you just mentioned, who they're disconnected as well. They don't realize that the Americans that the black Americans out of America, they're, the, they're descendants of people that were stolen from your own family and brought there. They don't, they don't see the connection between themselves and us over here. So like even, I forgot when the tour guide was mentioning something, when he was talking about how the women were being raped, what word did he use? And, and y'all had to correct him? 
what he said, they had a relationship or something like that. Some crazy he said, and he was like, no, rape. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I forgot what he was, what he, yeah, what, what he, he was said. Making it, he was trying to sterilize it. No, they was raped. Yeah. I forgot what word he used, but he, he used some like, as if it was almost like a, a romantic, voluntary consensual. relationship yeah, going like on. It was a consensual, you know, a relationship. You know. Right. And his, and his sisters they didn't let him get away with that. No, 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 no. No. Abdul Bar said he said relations. <laughs> okay. That's a battle lot. It, it is it is it's sister had to correct him. No, there ain't no relations, it's rape. Right? Because again, you know, especially when you're dealing with a lot of these tour guys, they're used to sanitizing stuff because they're not used to black Muslims being on the tour. They're used to Europeans and other people on a tour. So they, you know, they got to sterilize things for them. Right. So, uh, it's just like, no, 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 no. It was no relations. It's, 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 call it what it was. It's was rape. Exactly. And you know what, just to add, this is dangerous thinking, trying to discredit and disqualify somebody to tell their story. Our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was an unleaded prophet. He didn't read or write. So do we not take his message? Do we discredit him like he's not qualified to be the messenger of Allah in which Allah, you know, sent down and appointed? Like this, this mindset is dangerous. It's, it leads you down a rabbit hole that you cannot dig out from. So be careful with these people, how they talk about our, you know, by our history, because they don't want and, us to connect to it. And also that what you said reminds me, it goes back to where Kuta Kente came from, Jufure. Remember when Alex Haley went to Jufure and he met with the Grio, and I keep forgetting his name. Let me, I, I wrote his name down. Hold on for a second. Keba Kanje Fofana. When Alex Haley met with him, right? Uh, and he narrated the history. And then when he got up to Kunta's part, and it started connecting what we, he had heard from his own family on the American side, right? Uh, and so he built his whole roots on that, right? Do you know years later, other uh, academics came behind him and, and met with him and was like, oh yeah, you can't credit that because he didn't get it from any historical source. He just got it from just some old old, old dude telling stories. So they their, their mindset is, if it's not written down in the history book that they approved of, it ain't history. And you have to think, okay, if, if that's how you measure in stuff, right, what do we say about the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The recording of it came later. All of these things were preserved orally by memory, the Quran and the Sunnah, right? So we have to be careful about you know, what type of stuff we approve of and go along with as Muslims, because we don't understand how a lot of times we agree with stuff and ideas and things, and it undermines what we say we believe in. And this is why I think a lot of us, we get caught up in like a lot of crazy different groups or lead, if not outright groups, crazy ideas, because we don't understand this. Like a lot of Muslims don't even understand how the Quran and the Sunnah, the Hadith were preserved. They don't. Because they don't understand this point right here. They say, well, a hadith wasn't collected until several hundred years after the Prophet saw Allah. So it's words of men. Fool. The hadith were there. It was orally preserved. It was an oral tradition. Even today, the way the Quran is preserved is orally. You don't just buy the book. No. People that's memorizing the Quran is memorizing it by memory. Same thing with scholars of hadith, of hadith, a half of hadith. It's not because he wrote it down, because he memorized it. He knows it in his head. And so, and so, yeah. So, uh, uh, when I just had to laugh when I read that, you know, it should be viewed from being from a semi-literate author, and thus are filled with grammar, spelling, and interpretation issues. The one who's saying that probably don't even know half the amount of languages that Umar Ibn Sayyid knew. And this is coming from someone, we know what the people who are from that area today in 2021, 1444 Hijri, right? 
The people from that area today, what languages do they know? They know Mandinka. They know uh, Wolof. They know French. They know English. They, and if he's Fulani, they know Fula or Fulfulbe, right? Or Pular, right? They know that, right? So the average one coming from that area today who's not a scholar knows about three to five languages minimum. And nine times out of ten, the one that's saying that they that they are uh, uh, semi literate and all that kind of stuff probably only know one or two languages, at if that, right? And so, and and, and this is this is what they have to say about uh, someone who was prevented from writing, someone who was a scholar, right, before he was kidnapped and and forced into servitude. And had you know, you know, had you know, had to hide his faith and, and 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 pretend he was something else just so he won't get killed. This is this shows you the disconnect, and and this is why we shouldn't even be, really be dependent on waiting for for some of these people to tell us our history. They they can't do it. There's a disconnect. You know, uh, they look at their history the same way their ancestors looked at our ancestors as property, inanimate objects, people that lack feeling, right? So we shouldn't, we shouldn't even be like waiting for these people or, or anything like that. You know what I mean? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let's finish up. No, <laughs> no you're right. And you made that, that was the last point. That was another point rather. I don't know if it's going to be the last <laughs> that I wanted to make in order to, like we were considered like worse than cattle, right? Worse than animals. If they they couldn't be intelligent for us to use them the way we do, you understand? Like, like they were they qualified to be where they were, which we were not. But they have to, you know, push that narrative that we was illiterate. You know, I, you know, our grandma and you know, and, and knowledge of you know, you know, the language was you know was you know, you know, deficient. So you can't really rely upon them. Because they were animals. Animals don't communicate. They have they even they have their own language, but they we didn't even have a language because we they, that was supposed to be taken away, you know, all the way, but it wasn't, you know, subhanallah. Like even this author, he's a he's a white author, our brother Muhammad, right? Al he he mentioned because uh, many of these writings, people like, oh, it's just gibberish, he didn't know what he's talking about, and he had to come behind, like, listen, you don't know what you're talking about. This is just Ajami script. You, this is just this is just him writing his language using the Arabic script. It ain't gibberish. You just don't understand it. Exactly, it's a battle line, right? There's people, you know, people always real quick to dismiss and discredit someone when really the one that need to be discredited is you. You're not even qualified to be looking at this stuff. It's a battle. Ooh, it's a battle. You know, on page sixty-eight. Right. Okay. So no. Muska Cameron, 2015, wrote the senior thesis to discuss Omar Ibn Said, Laman Kebe, Abdul Rahim, Rahim Ibrahim, sorry, Joe Ben Solomon, London, Charno, Yaro Mahmoud, Bilali Muhammad, and Sali Bilali are covered in travel logs, slave narratives and newspaper articles during their lifetimes. Cameron looks through the writing of Mungo Park, Theodore Dwight, William Brown Hodgson, issues of the African Repository from the 1830s, and other journalistic coverage of the discussion of the importance of Arabic in the missionary and colonization movement in West Africa. Forbes and Usman, 2004, place Omar's autobiography in the context of other slave narratives and comments ex ex extensively on its unique nature of not needs proof that he wrote it or of its authenticity. They also discussed the use of the Quran and Bible in the narrative and how it was written and preserved for posterity. The article also discusses why Omar quoted Surah Mulk in the wording of his introductions to the Fatiha and the Lord's Prayer, and whether they reflect that he had converted to Christianity during the years before he wrote his autobiography. This was also published in Al Riaz's collection on Omar Ibn Said. David Sasovsky, June 27, 2019, runs a personal blog 
which has an article focuses on his research on four manuscripts written by Omar Ibn Said found in the scrapbook of Eliza Owens. The article is a narrative about his visit to the library where they are housed and his attempt to find a translator for them. David Gabriel Babian, May 2019, was able to skillfully translate and analyze the context and content of 17 short manuscripts, an autobiography, and several of the 40-plus annotations in an Arabic translation of the Bible in the hand of Omar Ibn Said. Even though most of the content was from Quran and the Bible, it still was able to represent a first-person narrative that expresses the life-changing events that occurred in war and capture and subsequent sale into the life of slavery. Bobby Enns finds that Omar's writing are an attack upon slavery and an expression of a spiritual search in a new land. In addition to his master's thesis, Bobby Enns also has a website which has images of all of Omar's available manuscripts with, translates, with, with translations. And if you have this book, the, our author, he provides in the footnotes links to these websites. That's why you need to have this book. It's very important. So we're going to stop there today. Remember, this is a, a deep dive on Umar Ibn Said. So we should be well-rounded with regards to his history and his story before we finish this book. Alhamdulillah. And uh, uh, so we're going to stop there. Are there any uh, questions, inshallah? Uh, Imamo said, is it a cultural disconnect or the fact that most blacks are mixed with their European descendants? I think it's a disconnect. Uh, even with a lot of us, because we, we haven't been taught this history. Like for those of us who went on a tour, obviously we have some interest in it so you know we are already you know we're the choir we're preaching to the choir right but uh i know that most of the uh africans that are still on the continent most of them don't have a clue about how we got here and they've they've all been told uh varying different very various different lies about us about how we got here like i've even heard from several people that it, a lot of people think that <clears throat> black americans a lot of africans think that black americans are descendants of some africans that left africa and said we're not african no more we rejecting being african and we american now and so you know there's some people that actually believe that and so that if if you talk to someone that believes that, you can kind of understand why some people have animosity towards us. Because, you know, in Africa, family, tribe, that's everything. And many of them think that we're a group of people that just uh, uh, disavowed where they came from, right? On top of that, many of them know nothing whatsoever about the slave trade. And if they know anything about slavery in general, it's just some vague idea, you know, two tribes fighting each other. And, you know, in the course of war, there's always prisoners. And so when they think about slaves, they think of prisoners of war. They don't, they're not thinking about a whole economic system. And, you know, just the same way inanimate objects are transported nowadays from one country to another, they don't recognize that we were the inanimate objects that were being transported. They don't, they don't have, a, they, they can't even fathom that. And even when you tell them that, it's almost like they don't believe you because this is not being taught in their schools. I mean, just for example, just, just like just even in Gambia, right? What schools do people go to? Either they go to Quran schools, which they, the history is not in the curriculum. They go to Arabic schools or they go to uh english schools for lack of better words basically schools that are trying to get them to be british right so if they go to schools that have any history being taught in them right it's from the british perspective and you know they ain't going to tell them this part you know you're they're not going to tell them about slavery and all that kind of stuff no 
just like here in America. Here in America, they're not, you know, in the public schools, they're not giving you no in-depth history about slavery and where the slavery, where the slaves came from and what type of society that the slaves came from. Why would they do that? Their propaganda was the opposite. Their propaganda is saying that, you know, the slaves came from places, they were uncivilized. Slavery was actually a blessing for these people. You know, we saved them. That's the narrative. So, so uh, I always say this because I'm trying to remind us that if you think they're lying to us in our classes, imagine what they're doing to them. On top of the fact that uh, education or well, public education is not compulsory like it is over here. Like you could get in serious trouble over here. You don't send your child to some type of school or at least do some type of acceptable alternative like charter school or home school or whatever, but your child better be registered to be in some type of school here. Over there, it ain't like that. And so if, if they're not in a rural area where you still have the local historian spitting that history orally, they disconnected from all of that. And there's some, and they can have some hodgepodge, some mixture of that. Some, some, some people are going to these schools, uh, either directly or indirectly run by people that are British or want to be British, or they just uh, strictly Islamic curriculum with no history in it. It's either or. So they're not going to get this history from nowhere. Let's see what I missed. In Nigeria, before they boarded the boats, they made the slaves drink from a poison well that was laced, laced with something to make them lose their memory. They tried to stop them from coming to America with the knowledge they possess, SubhanAllah. And even those uh, who were captured and enslaved and went through that, uh, and didn't go through that, excuse me, a lot of times, most, a lot of those ships didn't go directly to America. They stopped in the Caribbean. And those were like the breaking grounds where they like really broke them and also breeding grounds also and so even the those who were born on africa they would try to separate them from the ones who weren't born on africa in africa even a lot of times from their own children who were born in america they would do the separation why because they wanted to disconnect you from your history who you are they tried to take your humanity from you that's part of your humanity, that the Sharia, that Islam has come to protect. And they tried to take, they tried to take that from you, from our ancestors. Why that's why, you know, I hope we don't, I hope we we don't think that this is just some, it was just some haphazard thing that was hap, that was going on. No, this thing was very organized and very scientific. Literally. Excellent class. May Allah reward your family tremendously and grant you mass amount of success in this life and the next life. Ami, 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 Ami. Some of this information is in the book African President America by Ivan Van Serkin. Yep, old school book. I've been researching, ma'am, that the area that they took the enslaved people were not just Muslim in the common fair, but they were Ashari, Maliki, and Sufi, which was predominant at that time. Exactly. This is what we've been saying all along. So in a new short, they follow with the path, not just had title Muslim in the Western view. Exactly. This is what we've been saying. Okay, Samira. This is what this is what we've been saying all along. Not and we haven't been saying this like just now, just like in the last few weeks. We've been saying this for decades. Some of us. Like for some of us, this is not new. They didn't just take uh a vague you know, idea of Islam for us, from us, they they took a specific thing from us, not just Islam in general. They took the Faliki school, the Ashari Akita, and Tosawa from us. And really, when you look at Black people in general, the, the imagery that comes to my mind, we just don't know it yet as a people, is we just try, we just trying to find our way back to who we were. 
everything tries to find its way back to its origin, either consciously or subconsciously. And I look at us, right? We, we, we're in a dark basement and we're trying to find our way, you know, to the, you know, out or to the exit. Some of us, you know, don't have no light on at all. At all. We just complete darkness feeling our way around. Some of us got a little light. Some of us got a big bright uh, flashlight. Some of us, you know, all of us have varying uh, levels of visibility, but we all trying to get some ways. And sometimes, you know, because some of us don't have no light at all, we're going into a place that's even darker and darker than where we're at. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sufyan. The colonialists especially love to push a narrative myth of the of the lazy, lazy native. Yeah. Oh, they love pushing that. And that's why it's, it's amazing that we will even take anything they have to say seriously, right? Like, why would they tell the truth about themselves and the people they've conquered? Like, intellectually, that doesn't make no sense. Intellectually, you would expect them to justify everything that they've done. So, like, to me, it's, it's crazy uh, why anybody would take anything they have to say, you know, with any type of uh, seriousness. Alhamdulillah. Umar ibn Said is just one example of how they didn't just, they didn't bring lazy people over. If they was bringing lazy people over here, they wouldn't have brought them over here because they needed people to work, right? But not only that, they brought people here who literally built this country. African Muslims literally built this country. Af African Muslims and others built this country, built this place before it was even called the United States of America and everything. It was still colonies. Our ancestors built this place. Not just the, the manual labor, built it, literally. We're still in the underground railroad searching for intellectual freedom and our historical freedom. Okay. They did a good job, but this truth is resurfacing by Allah's will. Exactly. You know, just just like look at Surah Yusuf. Yusuf's brothers, out of jealousy, tried to get rid of them. And their plan was only part of Allah's plan. And by the time they re-encountered Yusuf, Yusuf was an authority over him and over them and a ruler. You know, it's just like what uh, Allah mentions in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, and this verse is mentioned uh, in reference to what the people tried to do to Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary, by you know, by by ratting him out to the Roman to the Romans, right? His own people, right? They plan, but Allah plans too, and Allah's the best of planning. Anytime you planning, you scheming, you doing something devilish, trying to hurt the protective friends of Allah, you only further in Allah's plan. You just don't see it. And so now these people did this, whatever. And this is why for them, Islam has always been public enemy number one, even when they pretend other people's public enemy number one. It's like, you know, if you, you know, if you did something to someone, right, you stole something from someone or you hustle somebody out of something from someone or you did something wrong, whatever it is from someone to, to someone, right? Even if that person doesn't know that you did it to them, you know that you did it to them. You know what you did. And every time that person's come, that person comes around, you feel threatened by their presence. Why? Because you know what you did to them. And you worry that, do they know what I did to them? Did they find out? Let me go feel their pulse. Let me, let, let me, let me engage them a little bit. Right? They, they feel threatened by, by that person. Why? The person is just living his life. No, but that person knows what they did to them. And they know that if the person finds out or if the person already knows and wants to seek vengeance, this thing can go get real ugly real quick. 
This is what one of the reasons why they make uh, Islam public enemy number one. I mean, we know as Muslims, if you look at the average Muslim here, the average Muslim here is more American than the ones who's born in America. They love America more than the Americans that were born here. So even the whole modern day narrative is, no, oh, the people hate our society and they're here and they're trying to undermine us and they want to kill us. No, man, they hate the society that they came from. That's why they're here. And they know that already. That's just game that they run. This is why it doesn't matter what a black person could be doing. A black person is always a threat to them. It doesn't matter. And a lot of black us black people don't understand. It don't matter where your hands are, where your pants is, what are you saying, what you're not saying, what you're doing, what you're not doing. You could be unconscious. You're still a threat to them because they know what they did to you. They know what they did to you. And even if they try to pretend, oh, that, that wasn't me. Uh, I'm only 40 years old. I, my, my parents ain't never owned no slaves. Uh, what, what, uh, and it, all those little weak arguments that they use, they know what they did. They know that they are recipients of the benefits of what their ancestors did to our ancestors. They know it. That's why we're always going to be a threat. Our presence here is a reminder. You can be minding your business. You can have your head down in your phone, earphones on, minding your business. Just you just exist. You're a threat to them because they know what they did to you. They know what they did. And our point is not to convince them of that. They already know it. It's us. We try to we that that's why one of our major sicknesses is that we always try to please other people. Listen, you're not going to please them. Why? Because it ain't have nothing to do with you per se. They know what they did to you. So they, they're always going to be threatened by your presence. Because if it was the, anybody else. Mo most people would not endure what we are enduring now. Just just take away the historical, take away slavery, take away Jim Crow. Let's act like that never happened. And just let's talk about what's going on now. Most people would not tolerate what's being done to us now at all. It would be on and popping. But we still here tolerating it, making excuses. But all the while, they know what they've done to us. They know that the books is cooked. They know that the playing field is not level. They know it. It's clear. So I kept saying they know what they did to us. They know what they're doing to us right now. They know it. it's clear. So just by you existing, you just breathing air is a threat to these people. You can you can be completely oblivious to what's being done to you and what was done to you, and just you're you're still a problem. Like I said, it's not because of anything you've done; it's because of what they what they are doing and what their ancestors have done to you and your people. And that's why it's important to keep the lie going. People don't want you to learn. They don't want you to. Uh, they don't want you to go back to. To get back what you had taken from you. Well, alhamdulillah. So I see there's no more questions. So inshallah, tomorrow we'll pick up from page seventy, inshallah, and uh, continue. Well, alhamdulillah. So once again, uh, if you want to. Get your copy of the book that we're going through, and you need to get your copy of the book that we're going through. Click this link right here. It's in the comments. It's in the thread already. And get yours, and inshallah, we ship within 24 hours. We're competing with Amazon. 
you know, you got Amazon Prime, and you buy something, you may get it tomorrow, right? We're competing with them, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless, bless you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in beneficial knowledge and have him trans have us translate, uh, transmit that knowledge from us to our loved ones. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashadu wa maa laha ila anta wa staqfurunka wa tubu ilayk wa ala asr inna al-insana na fi khusr inna al-nadhina amanu wa aminu salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh